So this table shows two main things. Um, one are the changing uh, conditions of the soil, the depth of the soil, how much nitrogen is there, the pH of the soil, and the depth of the litter fall, which adds nutrients to the soil. Um, and you can see that for different uh, stages in the succession. And, and these stages are characterized by the vegetation that's found there, the pioneers um, stage or the, you know, the pioneer stage being the early stages where you see um, cyanobacteria, mosses, lichens, eventually replaced by what's called mountain avens, this dryas dramundi, okay, and then that's eventually replaced by alder, okay, this taller vegetation, which is eventually replaced by spruce and western hemlock, which is the climax community in these particular areas. So you may notice that the soil conditions, the depth of the soil here in the pioneer stage is much less than it is as we go further through time into these other kinds of communities. And the spruce community has three times as much soil as the pioneer stage, okay? Nitrogen increases quite a bit through these different stages. The pH goes from being um, kind of acidic to uh, more acidic, which is kind of interesting. And um, spruce or a lot of evergreen trees, the needles of evergreens often provide acidity to the soil. So that's part of the explanation there. And the depth of the litter fall, the amount of litter fall certainly has increased uh, quite a bit, although not that different between the last two stages here. So the changing soil conditions, as you can imagine, are probably providing the proper conditions upon which each of these next succeeding communities, the next stage or serial stage. Serial refers to series, right? The idea that you have a series of stages, okay? So each stage, each um, serial stage um, is characterized by differences in soil conditions as well as differences in vegetation. These graphs just show the same kind of thing that we see um, changes in soil properties with different successional stages, right? We have the pioneer, the driest, the alder, and the spruce stage. And so we see increases in organic matter, increases in nitrogen, as well as increases in soil moisture. Looking at how the vegetation's changed over the years in, ter and in terms of the species richness, right? Number of species. Uh, that's just number of species. It doesn't take into account relative abundances, right? And this is years um, in successional stages. So 10 years for pioneer, 33 years we get to here, not up to the spruce hemlock until 200 years. So notice that species richness is increasing over time, which makes sense. There's more and more species. Um, and that it takes a century for trees to actually colonize by the time we actually get to spruce trees. And the final climax spruce hemlock community um, isn't reached until about 200 years, and the um, number of uh, herb and low shrub species has actually declined. So the number of species may be a little bit less, but the dominance of the trees is higher by the end here, or by the, by the final stage. It's not really the end, right? Cun communities continue in time, even if, they, even if individuals replace themselves in terms of the species that are found there. In spite of the fact that I've probably implied that most communities are facilitated by the community that was there previously, there are actually three different models of how succession can proceed. And this sort of classic facilitation model is just one way in which succession may happen or just part of um, the way in which succession could happen for any one community. And the, the idea that species are facilitated by previous colonists, for example, the um, one species comes in and changes the soil conditions and makes it just right for the next species, right? So then that the following species isn't really, um, the environment isn't really favorable for that earlier species, but now it's favorable for the new species. And this seems to make a lot of sense to us, but it's not necessarily the only way that succession can occur. Um, in the inhibition model, uh, species are actually inhibited by the action of previous colonists. And you might wonder, well, how can succession proceed if these colonists are preventing other individuals from getting there. And we're going we're to talk a little bit more about how inhibition can actually function within successional processes. And finally, there's the tolerance model where species are unaffected by the previous colonists, right? So all of these models depend on 
what the previous colonists are doing. <clears throat> are they facilitating, making it easier for the next species? Are they inhibiting, making it harder for the next species to come in? Or are they actually not influencing the next colonists at all? Inhibition actually functions in marine intertidal communities and is a primary method of succession there. And for example, there's the green algae uh, called ulva, okay? And ulva is um, likely to hang on and grow on rock faces pretty uh, substantially. So ulva, this green algae, and you can see ulva in this photograph over here, behind and in front of this crab. So this green algae tends to really take hold and it, and it inhibits the arrival of other species such as the red algae, uh, chondrocanthus. Okay, so chondrocanthus um, would like to get in here and grow, but although actually prevents it from coming in. But what happens is that when inhibition is going on, there are usually other methods of um, removal of a of an early successional species that provide disturbances or stresses that remove the pioneer species and allows the arrival of the next species. Okay, so here you can see that one biotic agent of disturbance here is this crab. So crabs tend to eat the ulva quite extensively and this can make space for the red algae to get in. Um, ulva is also, also more susceptible to intertidal wave action. So these physical disturbances, the abiotic as well as the biotic predation by the crab, both remove ulva enough so that chondrichthys, the red algae, okay, so this is, I mean chondrocanthus, sorry, said that wrong, chondrocanthus, the red algae, can gr grow and come in. So you can see that when ulva was removed, we see that chondrocanthus can really quite take uh, hold here. And when it's not removed, it tends to inhibit the presence of the red algae. So that in marine intertidal areas then, the succession of ulva to red algae does depend on things like these crabs. So you can imagine if crabs are over harvested by people for food or collected for souvenirs or whatever, um, then the succession in these intertidal areas are not going to proceed in the same way because ulva will just sort of take hold and not allow the presence of red algae. So inhibition does function in communities um, but the presence of other biotic and abiotic disturbances actually allow the succession to occur. This slide is an attempt to sort of summarize these three mechanisms of succession a little bit more. Um, as you can see that um, in the classic facilitation model, and again, this isn't necessarily how succession always happens. Um, A is replaced by B, B is replaced by C, C is replaced by D. Um, and um, so, again, the early colonists make uh, the conditions just right for the later colonists. And finally, you reach a climax community where species replace themselves. And again, um, often facilitation may be just part of what goes on during a succession as opposed to the whole successional process. Um, in both inhibition and in the tolerance model, um, communities are often uh, structured by the ones that just happen to get there first. You know, a lot of it depends on who gets there first in both this inhibition model and this tolerance model. So that in the case of the facilitation model, there's only certain species like pioneer species that can make it there. In these other models, there may be any number of potential pioneer species and whoever gets there first may be able to take hold and then inhibit further species from getting there in the case of the inhibition mechanisms that can take place. And in the tolerance model, again, the early species may just um, be whoever happens to get there. And then as these communities are replaced, um, in the tolerance model, 
Um, these ar all these arrows here are kind of saying that A could actually go to C, B could go to D. Any new species could come in and take hold because of the fact that they may be tolerated in this instance. And in a lot of ways, the tolerance model is somewhat similar to the facilitation model, except these communities are not paving the way for the next species to come in. They're just tolerating their arrival, and so the order of succession would be less predictable as well, although we would predict a more of a, a stable climax community. Um, this secondary succession diagram down here is just indicating in these subscripts that these species are just present as roots or as seeds, okay? And so the, the, the seeds of the roots allow the arrival of those uh, later species more um, to happen more quickly. So this is kind of a secondary succession facilitation mechanism down here. If you don't understand these diagrams that well, don't, don't worry too much about it. This figure from your textbook, I think, gives a much more detailed picture of what goes on within these three models. And um, because there's a lot of writing on here, let's just kind of look at this kind of a piece at a time. So in all three models... Um, a disturbance will open up a relatively large area of habitat, creating opportunities for colonization, okay? And then um, in the facilitation model, those species that arrive early are only certain early successional species that can get established. In the other two models, of those species that arrive, any are able to survive there as adults and can become established. So again, it's kind of a who gets there first thing. And then in facilitation, the early colonists modify the environment so it's less suitable for subsequent colonization. But in the tolerance model, um, early colonists modify the environment so that it may become less suitable, but this doesn't really have any effect on subsequent colonization. That's why this is tolerance. And in the inhibition model, um, early colonists modify it so it's less suitable for less suitable for colonization by both early and later species. Okay, and as long as individuals of the early successional species are present, they exclude or suppress subsequent colonists like that ulva. You know, unless a disturbance comes along, right? But here, are juveniles of later successional species that can colonize are already present and can grow to maturity even though other species are there, right? We're saying even though other species are there, they may tolerate new ones coming in. Okay, um, let's just for, move this up a little bit. So as we move along here with the facilitation model in green, um, species are facilitated until you finally reach a, um, a final climax community. And at the end here, for all of them, at this stage, further colonization and growth can occur when a resident individual is damaged or killed. Okay, and so that's kind of what's happening in the inhibition model right off the bat here. In the tolerance model, um, again, you have a continuing sequence, but a much less predictable sequence. Notice that the biggest difference between facilitation and tolerance is that the communities of the species that are found over time are going to be much more predictable in a facilitation model, and in the tolerance model, it may be a lot less predictable. There may be any number of species that may happen to grow there. Okay, and in the inhibition model, uh, the predictability may also be uh, a lot less than it would be in the facilitation model.